confined within the walls of a South African jail. The young lawyer from India found no reason to complain. Some say that jail is a palace. Others look upon it as a beautiful garden. Some others hold that through the jail gates we shall pass from our present bondage to freedom. The year was 1907. The young lawyer from India was Mohandas Gandhi. Gandhi led his fellow Indians in a non-violent struggle against racial oppression for eight years. They marched into forbidden territory. They burned their registration papers. They expected to be arrested, and they were not disappointed. Gandhi said, non-violent refusal to cooperate with injustice is the way to defeat it. J.C. Smuts, the interior minister, tells Gandhi, you reduce me to helplessness. How can we lay hands on you without looking like villains? He became known for his ability to mobilize people and for his increasingly simple way of life. He gave his non-violent weapon a name, Satyagraha, holding to truth. In every decade and on every continent, underdogs have taken up Gandhi's strategies to fight for their rights and freedom. Non-violence means fighting back, but you're fighting back with other weapons. The power that Gandhi discovered changed the 20th century. Major funding for this series was provided by Susan and Perry Lerner. Additional funding was provided by the Albert Einstein Institution, advancing the study of strategic nonviolent action in conflicts throughout the world. Elizabeth and John H. Van Merkenstein III, Abby and Alan Levy, and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. Sixty years after Gandhi's struggle in South Africa, his ideas found new followers in the American South. Students at Fisk University, a leading black institution, can ignore segregation on campus, but when they venture downtown, many are shocked by the southern system. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. And although I experienced segregation there, it was not the overt kind where there were signs on water fountains and on restrooms. It was humiliating. Well, Nashville was a totally segregated city. It was as segregated as Johannesburg, the height of apartheid. It was a city of two races. There was virtually no contact between the white community and the black community. In school, in neighborhoods, in jobs, in church, Nashville was a totally and completely segregated city and for the most part, totally satisfied and happy with that. Students at American Baptist College in Eastern Nashville know that segregation is being challenged that some are working against the violent repression, even lynchings that enforce it. They want to join the struggle. We've been taught one thing in the school about the Declaration of Independence, about the Bill of Rights, about the Constitution. And then in the, in the, in the real world, we were living something else. James Lawson, a Methodist minister from Ohio, soon gives Nashville's students 
a chance to take part. The soft-spoken Lawson is 30 and has spent three years teaching in India, where he studied the work of Mohandas Gandhi. In a small church near the Fisk campus, Lawson has started a series of evening workshops on nonviolent action. Now tonight we have a most important business to try to accomplish. Jim Lawson's manner is cool. His objective is breathtaking, to eliminate segregation. His classes attract Nashville's brightest students. A good friend of mine in, in Alabama here last April was taken out by the KKK and beaten on a tree, tied to a tree, beaten by chains and whatnot. I thought nonviolence would not work. But I stayed with the workshops for one reason, and that is because they were the only game in town. <laughs> that was the only group even trying to do anything to combat segregation that I knew about. He started praying, Father, uh, forgive these men. Jim Lawson has been encouraged to come south by Martin Luther King, Jr., who says the civil rights movement needs leaders who understand non-violent strategy and tactics. Then they started protesting. You can't pray that prayer, they said. Uh, and then others said, yes, but the man who's going to die has a right to pray any way he wants to pray. And this immediately started a division among them. Um, we took the whole group through a uh, holistic view of non-violence. It's history, its roots in the Bible, its roots in Christian thought. Uh, the methods of nonviolence. We told the stories of nonviolence. And I stressed the Gandhian idea of our being engaged in experiment. It may have much more meaning to the attacker if, as he strikes you on the cheek, you're looking him in the eyes. Unfortunately, the concept of nonviolence for many people is that you get hit on one cheek, you turn the other cheek, you don't do anything. But nonviolence means fighting back but you're fighting back with another purpose and with other weapons. Number one, your, your fight is to win that person over. And that is a fight. That's a struggle. That's much more challenging than fist to cuffs. Right. OK, thank you. Jim, if I were being beat, what is it that I would um, be able to do? We said we were going to desegregate downtown Nashville. Our first step was going to be desegregate lunch counters and restaurants. That, of course, was the first Gandhian step. That was the first step of nonviolence, to uh, research and examine and focus on an issue, choose a target, choose an issue. Now, let's see. Uh, Months before going to the lunchrooms, Lawson begins preparing them. A bunch of niggers. Well, look at the eight balls all lined up. Hi there, Jungle Bunny. He's so dark, he's making the whole place dark. He wants them to have experienced both physical and verbal attacks and to learn how to resist the impulse to run or fight back. Now let's see what we've learned from this to us as to how uh, we might act non-violently. What are the basic problems here so far? You cannot go on a demonstration with 25 people doing whatever they want to do. They have to have a common discipline. And that's, that's a key word for me, that the difficulty with non-violent people and efforts is that they don't recognize the necessity of fierce discipline and training and strategizing and planning and recruiting and doing the kinds of things that you do to have a movement. Uh, that, that, that can't happen spontaneously. It has to be done systematically. They stage their first sit-in on a Saturday when they are sure to be noticed. We spent many, many hours anticipating some of the opposition. And we knew that that's one of the things that they would say. We don't want to sit next to dirty people while we have lunch. And so one of the ways we combated that was by having a dress code. 
We had been told it was a possibility of being arrested. But we went to the lunch counter. We took our seats. We sat and we sat in a very orderly, peaceful fashion. They are not surprised when they are refused service. I said, I'm sorry, our management does not allow us to serve niggers in here. Store managers quickly close the dining areas, but the students remain until closing time, reading and doing homework. There is no violence, and no one is arrested. The sit-ins make page 10 of the Sunday paper. City editor John Siegenthaler remembers the reaction. The reaction initially was sort of shock and maybe even some humor. I mean, who do they think they are? <laughs> what do they think they're doing? Uh, we knew it was a news story, but didn't really know how to cover it. Local businesses take a predictable position. They'll close down before they'll serve black customers. A week later, the students are back. They provoke curiosity and verbal abuse, but no arrests. Whites still think the sit-ins are a passing fad, hardly a threat to the status quo. On the third Saturday, they are ready to target a total of six stores. Let each person now get himself or herself a partner that they will stick with. Now, we don't want a white person with a Negro of the opposite sex, because we don't want to fight that battle. We were told in advance that day that they were going to allow the hoodlums to beat us up, and then the policemen were going to arrest us. So we need to be prepared to get beaten and arrested. So that was a condition under which we went down. Oh, Master, you're not in a single group, are you? Will you go to this Woolworth group? We tried to be certain that our strongest and best leaders were leading each group that went in. We also had fairly disciplined groups go into each of the places that we decided to sit in on that Saturday. We decided that we'd have a second group ready for each store. Initially that morning, we had some 600 people ready to be arrested, in fact. By now, they're well prepared for contingencies. Each group includes a leader and observers who will phone reports back to the church. Observers are carrying telephone numbers for ambulance services and a pocket full of telephone change. As they enter the stores, the second and third waves of demonstrators stay out of sight, ready to move in when the first group is arrested. As predicted, the police hang back for the first 15 minutes. and asked each and every one of them separately to leave. They didn't leave, so I instructed the men to put them, place them under arrest. We placed them under arrest. Uh, when we cleared the stools, uh, some more colored boys and girls and white boys and girls got uh, on the seats. It really surprised the police. They thought they had lowered the boom. And uh, when they turned around and looked and saw a lunch counter, once again, full of Negro students. You could just see that they kind of looked at each other out of the corners of their eyes as though, do you see this? <laughs> what will we do now? And there was still another group ready to take their places. We, we felt so proud and so happy that the things that we had been taught in these workshops, the thing that we have learned, the role playing, the social drama that we had gone through, it was now we had to live it. And, and in a sense, I think we failed to convince ourselves that we had passed the test. You're in jail. Oh. I'm joking. <laughs> Man, what my mother's gonna say when she 
what did you hear about that? We had a philosophy, which was a power of nonviolence. And that kind of power, we felt, was more forceful than all of their police force, all of their lawmakers, and all of their dogs or billy clubs or jails, and that our capacity and willingness to suffer outweighed any power they had. Mass arrests are a victory for the students. Reporters realize they are covering a story of national significance. I mean, it was like being a war correspondent in your own hometown. The only thing you knew was that the war was on, uh, that the weapon of nonviolence was winning over violence, uh, and that this was a historic moment, however it came out. I think there was a sense of history there uh, that we all understood. At police headquarters on Monday morning, the students are still behind bars. On principle, they have refused bail. In just 48 hours, their small student movement has inspired thousands. Now the city's black community has joined in the struggle, organizing, raising money, recruiting lawyers. Alexander Luby is among Nashville's most prominent black lawyers, and he has organized local lawyers to defend the arrested students. As they come before a judge, their arrests, like Gandhi's, have dramatized their grievances. In the African-American community, there was a great sense of righteous indignation. People couldn't believe that these young, well-dressed, innocent college students are being arrested and put in jail. They didn't like it. And the, the city, African-American population was mobilized in such a fashion. And the movement spread through the city of Nashville like wildfire. As the crowds wait to see what the city will do, the mayor speaks to reporters. Anyone violating the law will be arrested. This must be so. By emphasizing law and order, the mayor takes sides with the store owners. In fact, the arrested students have broken no law, and none of the white attackers has been arrested. The uh, city and police were ill-prepared for a mass civil disobedience effort. They had anticipated that once the violence took place and the arrest began, our movement would dissipate, would be chased away, because that's the purpose, after all, of doing the violence and it's the purpose of doing the arresting. It's hopeful that then whatever this is will vanish, and that's the end of it. That didn't happen. A week later, nothing has changed. As the students return to the lunch counters, the city has only one answer, more arrests. On trial for disorderly conduct, they face a choice, a $50 fine or 30 days in the county workhouse. Refusing to pay fines to support a system which oppresses them, they opt for the workhouse. We had overloaded the jail. They didn't have enough you know, food or supplies and stuff like that. A lot of people had to work overtime, you know? And so it was a burden on the system. But that's what we intended. Now in the national spotlight, the movement is deluged with new recruits. Jim Lawson's workshops expand to meet the demand. Nashville's churches provide meeting space, telephones, mimeograph machines. Now they must get the message out far beyond Nashville. We were not simply addressing our immediate opponents. What we were doing was addressing the larger audience, the nation, the world. Because the strategy in nonviolence is that you educate a large number of constituents and win them on your side. In fact, even though 
uh, we as African Americans were minority, no change could take place unless you have the sympathy of the majority, if not the active participation. The students know that sympathy by itself may not be enough. Taking advantage of the outrage their arrests have provoked, they escalate the conflict. Sit-ins continue, but a new tactic is added, a boycott of the downtown shopping district. Picketers ask customers not to patronize stores whose lunch counters are segregated. The students have created a momentum, now embraced by the larger community as black clergy urge their congregation to stay away from the downtown shopping district altogether. It, it allowed for the whole community to be participants in the movement, because that's one of the things that we uh, in the nonviolent world always teach, namely that in the nonviolent movement, Everyone can be a participant. Children can participate. Women can participate. Men can participate. Young people, old people. Everyone can do the work. As the boycott takes hold, the sit-ins and arrests continue. The conflict becomes a seemingly permanent fact of life in the downtown shopping district. Picketing and boycotting provoke a racist backlash. But the counter-demonstrations backfire. Frightened white people begin avoiding the downtown area, unwittingly joining the boycott. A Fisk University economist calculates that some downtown stores have lost up to 40% of their business. As Easter approaches, the usual surge of spring buying never happens. Among blacks, the boycott is estimated at 98%. That was a powerful uh, message sent to the white community that, you know, it's one thing just to uh, deal with these students on a Saturday to Saturday basis and lock them up and let them get bailed out and we'll try them and send us some $50 fines. And that's sort all of thing. But it's another thing when you go down there and there's nobody on the street. At Easter, the counters are still segregated. But the sit-ins have put civil rights on the national agenda as never before. For the past several months, a new strategy to end racial segregation has been spreading through the South. On Easter Sunday, NBC's Meet the Press looks at nonviolent resistance. The moderator suggests that boycotts might be better than sit-ins and arrests. Dr. King, well, wouldn't you be on stronger grounds, though, if you refused to buy at those stores and if you called upon the white people of the country uh, to follow you because of both your moral and your legal right not to buy? I think, Mr. Spivak, sometimes it is necessary to dramatize an issue because many people are not aware of what's happening. And I think the sit-ins serve to dramatize the indignities and the injustices and the dissatisfaction of the Negro with the whole system of segregation. We had a meeting planned for 6 a.m. I was in the dormitory getting dressed and I heard this big boom. I soon learned that attorney Z. Alexander Luby's home had been bombed. It, of course, was the effort of the enemy to scare us off. Violence has a very simple dynamic. I make you suffer more than I suffer. I make you suffer until you cry uncle and you surrender. That's, that's what a war is. It's violence. The difference in, with nonviolence is we don't want to beat the opponent up. We don't think that does any good. Luby and his wife are uninjured. 
But as Lawson has taught his students, violence can backfire. The bombing has shocked the city and given the students a strategic opportunity. They send a telegram to the mayor demanding a meeting and they organize a silent march from the campus to City Hall. They begin with 1,500 marchers. Along the way, their number doubles. Mayor Ben West is waiting for them. West gets into an argument with a black minister, but then Diane Nash steps forward with some very direct questions. I asked the mayor, first of all, Mayor West, do you feel that it's wrong to discriminate against a person solely on the basis of his race or color? I tried the be as best I could to answer it, frankly and honestly, that I could not agree that it was morally right for someone to sell them merchandise and refuse them service. And I had to answer it just exactly that way. Nash goes on to ask the mayor whether he feels the lunch counters should be desegregated. He answers, yes. It was the first major change in the attitudes of the city. Nashville began to desegregate its public institutions uh, and its department stores that day. It took three, four years before theaters, restaurants, uh, all public conveyances were desegregated. But with Ben West's declaration, no, it's not right, the process of change began. The downtown retailers now tell the students privately they want to desegregate. The students devise a plan. We suggested to them, which was a great relief to them, that there would be no announcement that the demonstrations had ended. There would be no announcements that black people were being served. No announcements, no press, no police. Over a two weeks period, there would be a, what they call a, a trial basis where couples would go to a certain restaurant and eat and then there would be white observers, or there would be whites sitting nearby. It was all planned, and it worked very, very well without any incident. A movement that began in the basement of a small church in September has desegregated the downtown lunchrooms by spring. They go on to desegregate other restaurants and public facilities, showing how to remove business support for segregation by making it costly and controversial. It's a weapon that will prove decisive as the civil rights movement gains momentum. We realized that we had the resources, both the spiritual resources as well as the psychological skills to make a difference in other places as well. We understood how to organize a community. We all understood how to conduct a demonstration. We understood how to negotiate. And we understand how to deal with the media. We were warriors in that sense. We had been prepared. This was like a uh, nonviolent uh, academy, equivalent to West Point. For the rest of the decade, they carry what they've learned farther south and across the country. Reflecting on what they had achieved, one of Nashville's students wrote, you cannot wait for someone else to do it. You cannot wait for government to do it. You must make it happen through your own efforts and action and vision.
India, crown jewel of the world's greatest colonial empire. Britain has ruled India for more than a century. But in 1930, the Viceroy, Lord Irwin, knows a crisis is coming. A confrontation in which British military might will count for little. Irwin's adversary is Mohandas Gandhi, a man whose name is already a synonym for non-violent action, 30 years before the Nashville sit-ins. Since returning from South Africa, Gandhi has become his country's dominant political figure. He understands that control of India depends on Indian cooperation, not British coercion. He said, how can just 100,000 British troops control, at that time, over 350 million Indians? Just 100,000 British troops. Gandhi said, we'll stop doing anything that the British want us to do. The whole nation will come to a standstill. Civil disobedience on a mass scale. Many Indians welcome the struggle. Gandhi must find a way to use their energy to maximum effect. Gandhi retires to his headquarters on the Sabarmati River, near India's west coast. In the ashram, the spiritual community where he lives, he turns inward in search of a non-violent strategy for freedom. For weeks, he is alone in his Spartan office. He gives no hint of his thinking. They even commented... Uh, Narayan Desai lived in Gandhi's ashram during those critical weeks. Some, some said, oh, he's a very clever man. He doesn't want the British government to know what uh, strategy he's going to take. And he would all the time say, no, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for the call. And I know I will hear the inner voice. In February, he decides. He will begin by challenging the British tax and monopoly on salt. He writes the Viceroy, Lord Irwin, on March the 2nd. He explains the injustice of the salt laws and says he will go to the beach to make salt illegally. He will invite all Indians to do the same. He pleads with Irwin to negotiate. A few days later, a note from Irwin's secretary expresses the Viceroy's regret at Gandhi's plan of action. Gandhi sends advanced teams to choose a beach where civil disobedience will begin. In speeches and articles, he attacks the salt laws, emphasizing the injustice, especially to the poor. He knows that salt will be a powerful symbol. Every human being needs salt, and he wanted to take an issue which would involve one and all regardless of social status, regardless of uh, economic status, regardless of the work you did, without salt you and I can't exist. So he wanted to touch a chord in every Indian heart that here is something you and I and all of us need. Why should that be taxed? With a sharp instinct for political theater, Gandhi charts a route from his ashram to the sea. He and his volunteers will walk 240 miles. Being on the road for nearly a month, he believes, will build suspense and a bigger audience for his message. He expects to be arrested before he reaches the coast. At first light on March 12th, the great drama begins. At 60, Gandhi is the oldest of 78 marchers. Thousands join the procession, including police observers. But the government makes no attempt to interfere. They feared that he was so popular that there may be a violent outbreak. So they weighed the advantages 
and disadvantages of arresting them. And they also underrated this movement, Salt Satyagraha. They felt it might fizzle out. <laughs> and Gandhi woke ridiculous that uh, if he goes on marching and he does not commit any breach of the laws, we can't arrest him. What are we arresting him for? Gandhi wants to be arrested, but not too soon. The longer he marches, the more publicity he will receive. His messages are aimed equally at his immediate audience and the outside world, represented by dozens of journalists who have joined the march. In his speeches, he insists, we must not hate the British. They have not taken India from us. We have given it to them. Gandhiji, as I knew him as a schoolboy, was someone you admired, someone you looked up to, someone who was a saint. He was a saint because A, he dressed like a saint, and B, the things he said seemed to be very saintly. On the other side, as I grew up, I began to see a very shrewd student of human history. He was a man who absolutely understood human psychology. He understood the British idea of fair play. He understood that and he knew how to play on that sentiment. Although the Crown never hesitates to use force, British administrators pride themselves on their enlightened rule and the cooperation they receive from Indian officials. Gandhi intends to remove Indian consent to foreign rule. The Salt March will create a dilemma. If they arrest him, all India will rise up in protest. If he is permitted to openly defy the law, British control will be lost, perhaps irretrievably. In every speech, Gandhi explains the power of nonviolent resistance. He asks local leaders to quit their government jobs. When everyone refuses to cooperate, he says, the British will be able to do nothing. He was asking the village headmen to resign their posts. And I think 140 or so did resign. Why did he ask them to resign? It is a government, foreign government, running this country for their own benefit. And why should you serve it? Otherwise, how do you fight against oppression? Either you take to assassination, to bomb making, or you use non-violent methods. It doesn't, may not give you quick results. You may lose materially, your limbs may be broken, you can lose your life. Defying rumors that his health is failing, Gandhi sticks to his schedule. At every rest stop, he asks, how many local officials have quit their government jobs? How many villagers are wearing khadi, the handmade cotton cloth that is the informal uniform of his movement? Gandhi tells Indians not to buy imported cloth. He spins cotton for two hours every day to dramatize the millions of jobs lost to imported British cloth. Gandhi says, if every Indian will spin at the same time, the song of the spinning wheel will become the song of freedom. He gets by on four hours sleep. He must persuade thousands of volunteers to be arrested and go to jail, or his long march will end in failure. And here was a man who understood how to get the maximum exposure for his message. And in a sense, you can say he was in one of India's greatest, uh, I hate to use the word, but within quotes, advertising men. And as he marched, long before Martin Luther King's march on Washington, Gandhiji was the originator of this. And as he marched and as he marched, people began to spread the word. He's on the march. He's going to defy the law. 
Let's join him. This is a chance to show the British without having to hit them, to show them that we stand for something. We are not just slaves. And by God, by God, even I, who was only a schoolboy at that time, I tell you, my hair stood on end when I realized he was slowly approaching the goal. And we all knew once he picked up that handful of salt, he would be arrested. On the 24th day, the marchers approached the sea. An American newspaper editorializes. As Britain lost America through tea, it is about to lose India through salt. On the eve of the law breaking, Gandhi meets on the beach with 12,000 supporters. Hold the salt in your fist, he suggests, and think it is worth 60 million rupees. That's how much the government has been taking from us through the monopoly on salt. At dawn on April 6th, Gandhi bends down and picks up a lump of mud and salt. News that Gandhi has broken the salt law electrifies the country. Thousands march to the shore to follow his example. Jawaharlal Nehru, India's future prime minister, describes the mood. It seemed as though a spring had been suddenly released. All over the country, salt manufacture was the topic of the day. It was immaterial whether the stuff was good or bad. The main thing was to commit a breach of the obnoxious salt law, and we were successful in that. This tremendous success of Salt Satagra was not foreseen by the British. There were many skeptics who thought Salt Satagra what? You can't unseat the king emperor by boiling sea water in a kettle. So that was the assumption. But in a non-violent struggle, it is the insight of the leader which matters, you know. What will mobilize the people? What will make them feel that they have a cause to fight for? And what will make them fight it non-violently? As his movement engulfs the country, Gandhi is surprised he's not been arrested. Visiting seaside villages he encourages civil disobedience, which he says is only the beginning. Today we are defying the salt law. Tomorrow we shall have to consign other laws to the waste paper basket. We shall practice such non-cooperation that finally it will not be possible for the administration to carry on. When you are non-violent, how do we tackle you? How do, how do we meet your challenge? At the most, we can imprison you. And if we imprison you again, you become more popular. You can't, we can't use arms against you. We can't use violence against you. So here is a person who has evolved a technique which uh, overpowers the British. From the government in New Delhi, Lord Irwin cables London. The personal influence of Gandhi threatens to embarrass the administration. And in some areas, he has already undermined government authority. Gandhi's headquarters are on the beach. A month after he picked up the first lump of salt, he announces an escalation. He and his volunteers will seize the government salt works in the nearby town of Darasana. Near midnight on May 4th, he writes to Lord Irwin, offering three ways to stop the raid on the salt works. End the salt tax. Arrest the raiding party. 
or break their heads. He finishes the letter and retires for the night. By the next morning, Gandhi is behind bars. He is delighted. The arrest sets off a firestorm. In city after city, normal life comes to a standstill. Lord Irwin announces a strategy of steady pressure. Police are to use minimum force. Irwin issues emergency ordinances. Political meetings are prohibited. The press is censored. The Indian National Congress Working Committee is banned. Irwin's plan to avoid repression fails as the new ordinances provide new opportunities for law-breaking. Thousands are arrested, exactly what Gandhi wants. A batch of policemen came to arrest my father, and uh, some of us young children were following the police van. And instead of saying, uh, bye-bye, papa, or something like that, I was telling him, papa, this time, no less than two years, which means I want you to be in prison for no less than two years. You see, it was a, it was a pride to have your father uh, uh, sentenced for two years, and not for three months or so. So Gandhi's idea is what had touched even the children in that atmosphere. Gandhi's raid on the Darasan assault works goes forward without him. A well-known poet, Sarojini Naidu, leads the siege. She instructs her army. You must not use violence under any circumstances. You will be beaten, but you must not resist. You must not even raise a hand to ward off the blows. After 10 days of skirmishing, 2,500 demonstrators confront the guards head on. Police attack the Satyagrahis with steel-tipped clubs called latis. A United Press reporter, Webb Miller, witnessed the scene. They went down like 10 pins. I heard the sickening wax of the clubs on unprotected skulls. Those struck down fell, sprawling, unconscious, or writhing with pain, with fractured skulls or broken shoulders. Miller's report is published in nearly 2,000 newspapers and read aloud in the US Senate. One Satyagrahi explained, our object was to show the world at large the fangs and claws of the government in all its ugliness and ferocity. In this, we have succeeded beyond measure. In midsummer, the struggle is undiminished. Even with Gandhi and most nationalist leaders in prison, government has effectively lost control of major cities. Press reports of police brutality damage the British cause almost as much as the resistance campaign. Irwin cables the governor of Bombay. I am sure these Lati charges are exactly what our enemies want. We should be racking our brains for a way to deny them this advantage. In July, government reports nearly 17,000 civil resistors have been arrested. Gandhi's goal of filling the jails is more than self-sacrifice. It is mass disobedience and is steadily eroding British authority. If an authority enjoys power, 
He enjoys power to the extent to which obedience is rendered. But moment the obedience goes off, moment the laws are disobeyed, moment the command of the powerful are not obeyed, your power vanishes. Those who can't endure the hardships of jail can still help in the fight, boycotting or picketing shops which sell British goods. When sales suffer, Lord Irwin issues a prevention of intimidation ordinance against picketing. The result? More arrests, as bystanders cheer. British trade with India drops 25%. And in December, three out of four foreign cloth shops are closed. By January, the British Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, sees that negotiations are the only way to end the standoff. He orders Gandhi and the other leaders released. The national movement remains strong as Gandhi's release is celebrated. But the commander knows his foot soldiers need a rest. On February the 14th, he informs Lord Owen that he is ready to negotiate. He insists that salt making and boycotts will continue during the talks. At the Viceroy's palace in New Delhi, Gandhi is the first Indian ever to meet with a British ruler as an equal. Negotiations last three weeks. Irwin refuses to give ground on the salt laws and cloth imports, concessions which would alienate his Indian collaborators. Gandhi secures the release of political prisoners and the lifting of repressive ordinances. He calls off civil disobedience. Constitutional issues are pushed back for later talks in London. There were many people who were not satisfied. They thought that perhaps Gandhi compromised and perhaps went out of his way. But Gandhi's argument always was that this movement is not in vain because it is through such movements that is training people that you can't have everything at one stroke. You compromise, you gather your strength, you train yourself and then take the next step. A year after the Salt March, India remains under British rule. But Gandhi has ended the pretense of British legitimacy in India. By exposing injustice and ending Indians' consent to foreign rule, he has awakened the people to their own power and set India on the road to independence. Britain grants Indian independence 16 years later in 1947. Within a year, Gandhi is dead of an assassin's bullet. Far beyond his accomplishments in India, his vision and his practice of non-violent conflict have set an example for future generations. He had once said, my technique of non-violent struggle is in the same stage as electricity in Edison's time, to be refined and developed. Every weekend, they bury their dead. In the last year, news of black youth shot by police has become as common as the weather report.
It's been called an uprising. Millions of black South Africans have intensified their struggle for equality, an end to the legalized discrimination called apartheid. Security forces have become newly aggressive in the black townships, a provocative target for angry young people. Even innocent bystanders are being caught in the deadly cycle of rising violence. And all the casualties are on one side. Appalled by the bloodshed, a new generation of township leaders is organizing, looking for more effective ways to fight back. Now, are, this unhealthy situation here at Kubega. In Port Elizabeth, the 27-year-old Mukaseli Jack has been a youth organizer since his teens. There was a frustration in the township as to what was happening. There was a serious confrontation with young people fighting with the police with their bare hands, you know, and police shooting at them without mercy. And then he said, let us expose these policemen for what they are. Let us take this fight in the townships away and bring it right to their homes. Taking their struggle into white South Africa is a new idea. Some black communities around Port Elizabeth have effectively liberated their townships from apartheid rule. And they are being punished with brutal police efforts to regain control. But making the townships ungovernable has not seriously threatened the apartheid state. Two miles away, most whites in Port Elizabeth are unaware of the strife. White-owned newspapers and state-controlled television do not report township disturbances. But a handful of whites have joined the anti-apartheid movement. One of them is Janet Cherry, a young social worker who has been an underground member of the outlawed African National Congress since college days. The idea was that we've got to take the struggle into the white areas, not because of any racist motive, but because of that understanding that the state wasn't in fact vulnerable unless you made an impact outside of the townships. We understand. That is why we're carrying... Mukseli Jack's idea to take the struggle into the white community will require mass support. That we are going to achieve freedom in our lifetime. He has seen how easily the state destroys loosely knit groups by arresting their leaders. For several years, he has worked tirelessly to create more deeply rooted civic organizations, street by street. The black civic movement has been growing. In 1983, the United Democratic Front was created as a national umbrella for over 600 local civics, street committees, church groups, sports teams, women's clubs. As this organization broadened and broadened and broadened and broadened, it became extremely difficult for the security forces to crush these people because now you have big centers of resistance within the community. And then slowly you started everybody to include him in the struggle for justice. And slowly everyone saw his role. In May 1985, several middle-aged women approached leaders of the Port Elizabeth Black Civic Organization to suggest a boycott of white business. A consumer boycott has the potential to achieve Mukaseli Jack's objective, to put pressure on the white community for the first time. Boycott organizers have only a few weeks to prepare. Half a million people must be persuaded to shop inside the township rather than downtown. And black business must be ready for a surge in demand. The preparation was to tell, the, to bring uh, the business, black business people in the townships and tell them that we want them to stock the basic necessities that will be needed 
for this long drawn struggle that we're going to face. And we told them that to drop their prices. We went to the church leaders, we went to the schools, and uh, we, we spoke to the bus drivers, the taxi drivers, tell them that you can't bring those things to the township because we have a boycott there. Weekly funerals, the only public gatherings not prohibited by the government, are their only opportunity to rally support for the boycott. Two days before the boycott will begin, Mukseli Jack is the main speaker. And I'm going to say, they can take us to jail. On Monday, it's the DJ. Monday, it's the DJ. Monday, it's the DJ. Monday, it's the DJ. We will die in town on Monday. It looks the same as any other morning. But by 10 a.m., the difference is obvious. The North End, normally jammed with black shoppers, is deserted. Observers sent to monitor the boycott report 100% compliance. When we did our walks about in town, we see the shops closed and no one buying in town. Then you saw that uh, there was 100% support from our people. That inspires you. That inspires you a lot. The boycott is the latest tactic in a 10-month uprising. But in only five days, it has proven the most effective weapon yet, and it is spreading elsewhere. A genuine threat to the apartheid regime. This state of affairs can no longer be tolerated. The government has, in terms of the Public Security Act, Act 3 of 1953, decided to proclaim a state of emergency in the following magisterial districts. Port Elizabeth, Albany, Udenike, Craddock, Kirkwood, Somerset East, Adelaide, Port Beaufort, Bedford, Alexandria. There has not been a state of emergency since 1961. The South African Army occupies the townships. Travel is restricted. Night and day curfews are imposed. Hundreds are arrested. Young males are singled out for brutality, but repression does not diminish the boycott. Security forces have little success rounding up the leaders. Most are anonymous outside their own neighborhoods, dispersed among dozens of street committees and civics. If they declare a state of emergency, they were panicking because they were, we were becoming effective. They were feeling us coming. They were feeling us coming. So to us, the state of emergency showed that extraordinary measures were to be implemented in order to keep apartheid alive. And we knew then that we got apartheid in a crisis. And we were there, we were there to give it the push, to push, to push. With this power, massive power we could do amazing wonders because right in the first three weeks shops began to to close can you believe it it was freedom celebration when we heard that one shop was closing we just celebrated thank you and then the other one please come thank you mukseli jack goes into hiding to avoid arrest 
Moving from house to house, he consults with the boycott committee on how to exploit their success. They add new conditions to the demands which must be met before they will lift the boycott. We had uh, concrete demands, and these demands dealt in those days with uh, uh, simple things when you look at them today, uh, like uh, opening of uh, public amenities or facilities to all races, uh, taking out of the troops from the township, making this available, whatever was not available, and end discrimination in the workplace, etc. And uh, we also had uh, what we call long term at the time, you know, like talking about Mandela's freedom was like, oh my goodness, this is something, my child, because the other people will discourage us about this. No, no, leave that. That's impossible. We, we waited until the pain went into the bones. Otherwise, what was the strike for? We waited, we took our time because we were losing nothing and they were losing hundreds of, of friends. And then the Chamber of Commerce ultimately said we have to talk to them. Uh, many of the demands we have, most of the demands, in fact, we have every sympathy with. After meeting with Jack and the boycott leaders, the Chamber of Commerce director talks with reporters. Uh, yes, there are demands which, uh, which we can address directly, and those we obviously will. There are others which have to be addressed by the government, and we feel there that it's our duty and responsibility. The consumer boycott was making an impact on the white community, in that it opened up uh, people's minds to the necessity for change. And the ANC, in fact, parts of the ANC were quite convinced by this argument, which is one of, of dividing the ruling class, if you like, or the ruling bloc, that you have to split off sections of it. Jack has been a well-known youth leader for several years. Now his role as boycott spokesman has made him a serious threat to the regime. He was an extreme troublemaker. <laughs> An activist uh, in the true sense of the word, yes. Colonel Lawrence Duplessis was chief of military intelligence for the Eastern Cape province. They're not really committing a crime. <laughs> like you said earlier, if, if they don't want to buy, it's not a crime if they don't want to buy from people, but it's, it's mass action. And, and what do you do? You can't shoot all these people, you can't lock them all up. It's very effective. Well, Gandhi started it, if I'm not wrong, <laughs> passive resistance. Enjoying their success, the black population of Port Elizabeth maintains its solidarity. When security forces realize the boycott is not disintegrating, they decide to take action. On the night of August the 2nd, Mukaseli Jack and the boycott leaders are arrested and taken to St. Albans prison. They picked us up at home, 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. And I remember they definitely said to us, this state of emergency will ensure that the boycott won't last three weeks. After three weeks from now, there won't be any consumer boycott. And you leaders, you will be rotting in jail. People will go back to work, will go back and buy in town, they will forget about you, they won't want to even hear a thing about you. But three weeks passed, two months passed, and uh, people are carrying it on. Once the government decided to throw everyone in jail, and you recall that, how about 30,000 people who were thrown into jails in terms of the state of emergency of 1985. Once you remove the leaders, you create even greater conditions of desperation. And you can have a situation of mayhem. And this is what, you know, the state had pushed South Africa into. Spontaneous outbursts by angry young people now jeopardize the movement. Among the few courageous enough to warn of the danger is a South African churchman, 
Bishop Desmond Tutu. Why must we discredit our cause by using methods which, if they were used against us, we would oppose? We must, we must remember, we must remember, my friends, that we have been given a wonderful cause. The cause of freedom, yeah. of justice, yeah. of goodness. And you and I, you and I, must be those who will walk with head held high. We will say, we use methods, we use methods which can stand the scrutiny, the harsh scrutiny of history. By September, Port Elizabeth retailers are desperate. By keeping Mukseli Jack and his comrades behind bars, the regime is preventing negotiations that could end the crippling boycott. Jack suddenly has powerful white allies. I mean, a respected businessman going, now looking for these people that have been described as, uh, as hooligans and as uh, thugs. Now the businessman says, these leaders got legitimate grievances. If they have committed a crime, take them in front of a court of law and try them and find them guilty or innocent. Don't just lock them up. The boycott enters its fourth month. Thousands of blacks are still coming to their jobs in white-owned shops, but they buy nothing. White businessmen have been negotiating a deal. The boycott will be suspended if the businessmen can arrange for the black leaders to be released. We were not intending to antagonize these white people, but our idea was just to drive our point home. Nonetheless, it's our people, let's not destroy them. Then we stop that boycott at that time. And uh, you see, when we stop it, of course also, it served two purposes. The pressure on our constituency to go and shop for Christmas was going to lead to some cracks within our own uh, ranks. So we hit two birds with one stone, saved those people, and also kept our unity intact for the next fight. The Christmas shopping season is back to normal as businessmen begin serious negotiations with the boycott committee. Mukseli Jack and his colleagues have set a deadline. If their demands are not met by March 31st, the boycott will be reimposed. Their short-term successes have given Port Elizabeth's blacks a sense of confidence. Their leaders have been released from prison and troops have been withdrawn. But as the deadline approaches with no progress on their major political demands, they prepare a new boycott. Unexpectedly, on March 11th, the government bans two civic leaders. One of them is Mukseli Jack. The banning order is a form of house arrest, which halts negotiations. The Reagan administration's point man on South Africa today accused the Pretoria government of a deliberate sham. Assistant Secretary of State Chester Crocker told a congressional committee it was a sham for South Africa to signal its willingness to negotiate with the black majority while politically banning two black leaders yesterday. At that point, uh, there was uh, a build-up of international pressure, build-up, exposing that this was no more apartheid, small apartheid. It was complete fascism because almost every paper was banned, every individual was banned. People were serving banning orders. And then uh, the UN was serving uh, apartheid on the agenda on, on a daily basis. And if you remember that time, you were, major corporations were running away. You know, it was embarrassing. 
Economic sanctions against South Africa are being debated in the US and Europe. Most governments are resisting, saying that state-imposed sanctions would hurt ordinary people more than the government. But now, as black South Africans call on Western governments to impose punitive sanctions, an exodus begins, led by AT&T, IBM, GE, Ford, General Motors, and Coca-Cola. March 22nd, a Supreme Court justice lifts the ban on Mukseli Jack, saying the government has given insufficient reasons. The victory energizes the movement, just nine days before the new boycott is scheduled. Jack tears up his banning orders, using the celebration to cement the solidarity they will need in the weeks ahead. We are trusting that we are, bring, we are going to bring water down in his knees. Our buying power, our buying power is going to be the thing that is going to decide the future, that is going to decide our destiny in this country. It is clear, the 1st of April, we know we will not buy him in the Babu Gambia town. The boycott is on. It will continue for nine weeks and then a shock. Security forces scour the black townships, arresting thousands. The government has secretly imposed a state of emergency. The effect is martial law, a drastic move meant to stop disturbances on the 10th anniversary of a major township uprising. For hours, police raid the offices of black civics, trade unions, the UDF, the South African Council of Churches, arresting and confiscating documents. Peaceful protesters at the parliament buildings are dispersed and arrested. Damage to 11 church buildings 16 hours after the crackdown started, President Berta speaks in parliament. He cites intelligence reports on the imminent threat of armed revolution by the ANC and Communist Party. These revolutionaries are controlled by a power clique which is typical of Marxist regimes and which is interested only in a violent takeover of power. It is not possible for the reasonable majority to continue the search for a peaceful and democratic solution. It is the second state of emergency in less than a year. The emergency will be renewed every year for three years, an admission that repression has become the primary function of the state. Anti-apartheid forces are driven underground, but not destroyed. They have not brought the government down, but non-violent mass action has shattered its legitimacy. The system of apartheid is no longer viable. Power has shifted to black communities and their social organizations. The end of apartheid is only a matter of time. You know, there wasn't a, a, a principled stand against the use of violence, and in fact, it was widely acknowledged that the ANC was, he was conducting the armed struggle. But despite all of the rhetoric of the ANC about the armed struggle and so on, that it was in fact the activities of the UDF in mass organization which brought about the change in South Africa, really that it was that, form, that mass organization which put pressure on the state to 
ultimately to change. I mean, that, that brought about the, the stalemate, the impasse, where the state could no longer respond. The eyes of the world are presently focused on all South Africans. F.W. de Klerk becomes no president in late 1989, after P.W. Botha is forced to resign. De Klerk acts quickly, unbanning political organizations and ordering the release of Nelson Mandela, who has been imprisoned for 27 years. By refusing to renounce armed struggle, Mandela has prolonged his imprisonment by years. During that time, the passivity that had once allowed apartheid to exist has been swept away by the spirit of a confident civil society. The armed struggle uh, came to nothing as far as I'm concerned. The people, the people brought it about. And pressure from overseas, that is what really, uh, in the end, made it clear and people understood that we couldn't go on, on any... That's why the clerk had to take the actions that he took. In 1993, Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk share the Nobel Peace Prize for negotiating a constitution that guarantees equal rights for all South Africans. They will soon face each other in South Africa's first democratic elections. <laughs> Asking for peace in the rest of the country. Lord of Lords, we kneel before you, Father. Appealing, asking for peace in the rest of the country. They have never in their lives voted, nor have their parents or their grandparents before them. Our Father, we are asking for peace in our world. Reveal yourself, reveal yourself. Reveal yourself, reveal yourself. Reveal yourself, reveal from heaven. The struggle against apartheid, against the racism in South Africa, fundamentally had been non violent. We were inspired by what had happened in India, in, in Poland, in the civil rights movement uh, in the United States, what was happening in the Philippines. I suppose that human beings l looking at it would say that um, arms, arms are the most dangerous things. Uh, that a, a, a dictator, a tyrant, uh, needs to fear. But in fact, no. It is when people decide they want to be free. Once they have made up that, their minds to that, there's nothing that will stop them. series was provided by Susan and Perry Lerner. Additional funding was provided by the Albert Einstein Institution, advancing the study of strategic nonviolent action in conflicts throughout the world. Elizabeth and John H. Van Merkenstein III, Abby and Alan Levy, 
and the Arthur Binding Davis Foundations.